Good morning, everybody. If you've just joined us, welcome uh, to the unforgettable presentation. And this is probably the furthest I've ever stuck my neck out on a webinar. Uh, it's uh, I think there's only I could only go one worse, which is how to give a webinar. Um, but this one already feels pretty dangerous. Uh, so there we go. Um, so the scheme for this morning's webinar is going to be something like this. Um, I'm probably going to spend around about 30 minutes on the material. That'll take us to around about uh, 10 o'clock. And then we'll have some Q&A uh, for about 10 minutes. And then uh, the summary which hopefully will take into account everything, all the main bits and the real nuggets that I think are important from this morning, including uh, stuff that you might have come up with. And then uh, I will aim to finish at 10.15 on the dot. If there are more questions left over, I will stick around. So I guarantee um, that if you have a question and you post it up to us during this webinar, then you will get an answer out of me. So that's how this morning is going to pan out. So um, first of all, what is the problem with presentations? Um, so what I'm, I want to do is, is actually to ask you uh, to comment in the questions uh, pane here. So the, and the question I want to put to you is what makes presentations boring and therefore forgettable in your opinion? So Laura uh, thinks the slides are too busy. Um, people who just read slides, Victoria says that. The presenter, Gary, nice one, Barry, yes. Well, it might not be her fault or his fault, but the presenters can make it boring. Too much text, not enough interaction, Margaret says. Sharon says too much text is boring. Pat, um, boring equals too much text, too many numbers and stats, yuck. I hated stats. Uh, too detailed, Kate, uh, welcome back. Uh, Jackie M, repetitive, uh, words on screen and words spoken are the same. Yes, that's my pet hate as well. Too many PowerPoint slides, says Anne. Tony says, no passion. Mm. Uh, reading off the PowerPoint, says Jeff. Um, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. Oh, gosh, I better not do that today. Uh, not the slides themselves always, but sometimes the speakers, says Jackie. The lack of story, says Petra. I absolutely uh, chime with that or uh, that chimes with a thought in mind. And you'll see more about that. Uh, Vicky, dull voice, lack of intonation. That's one I hope to stay clear of. Uh, no emotional connection, says Kate. Uh, Jackie again, lack of flair. Charlotte, lack of context. No picture, Andrea says. Long, says Tim. Not getting to the point. Or not getting the point. Waffle. Dry talk. My goodness, we could go on forever. Uh, Vicky says lack of clarity uh, about the purpose and outcome. Sorry, back to the audience. Oh, I see. <laughs> that was Jeff. Uh, a presenter who does not know his material. Steve says, yes, it's it's uh, and Jackie again. No takeaway. So you have engaging slides, but nothing to refer to afterwards. And no interaction with the audience is another one. Thank you very much for all of those. And there's uh, not one of those that I unfortunately can't I identify with. The problem, as, as a number of you have pointed out, is that people use a lot of props, in particular PowerPoint, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes time. And what they forget to do is to demonstrate their personality. They use words and behaviours that they would never use with each other. And something happens, and I sometimes do this when I'm running a presentation skills program, I'll get people just to stand up and come uh, to the front of the room where I am and to start talking and they behave completely differently and they haven't even got a presentation to give. So something happens to us when we get to our feet. The problem is that the way we're put together, uh, us humans are easily bored. So we we want novel things. We like new things, but we adapt too quickly for new things to stay new. So the only thing that can keep us going 
that can keep us engaged is an interaction with a, with another human being. That's what we need. We need somebody who's live in front of us. And then that person, if they have the personality, if they have a little bit of creativity, if they have passion, as one of you said, then something special can happen. So what I'd like to do is to get you to question the way that you present and what you use to convey your ideas so that you sometimes, like me, can sometimes manage to give a presentation which is really unforgettable. So the objective, let's start, let's start with the objective. Uh, somebody, a couple of you all alluded to objectives. Now, I have a different way of setting objectives. And what I am particularly interested in, in fact, I'll say I am only interested in, is how I want somebody to feel. I'm interested in the feelings. Because if we can get people to feel something, we can get them to remember. At the extreme, there's something you may be familiar with called flashbulb memory. When something big emotional happens, we remember what was happening at the time. Now, we're not going to always be able to come up with the exciting material to enable us to do that. But if we focus on the feelings, we can do things that we have an objective. It's kind of like a vision. I want people to feel like this. So everything that I do be it um, maybe happy or, 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 um, or like optimistic. If I want people to feel optimistic, for example, about the performance of the company, then I will do things like, you know, drawing in green um, and I will draw shapes. Somebody, I was looking at their presentation the other day, we were going through it. It was a mega presentation. The top 75 managers from around the world, big global organization. And and he had he had a graph like this. In fact, he had the line was red and he had it and he was showing sales figures going up like that. And what bothered me was that actually there was any any downturn at all. I said, take that out. They don't want to know that. And that's not the feeling you're trying to give them. You're trying to get them excited. And by the way, change the color of the graph. Now, we know that colours mean different things. And I don't know what you associate these with. I've just gone and drawn the the uh, French flag by accident, um, uh, which is uh, rather apposite. So, <laughs> but red, we all know, is danger. Yellow even. And in fact, if I, if I do yellow and then black, that seems to have a particular effect on us. And if you are uh, scared of insects, this particular combination will remind you of probably a wasp or something like that. So the colours are really important. That was particularly uh, brought to my attention when I was finishing off writing up uh, my thesis and a statistician I was working with, a brilliant mathematician um, called uh, John. He said, you know, Professor John said, look, be really careful about how you present your information. Your, your, your graphics have to tell a clear story. And he was the one who really pointed my attention to, 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 to the use of colours and shapes and how much I showed. Also, we can use we can use objects uh, instead of of words. And I think that for me is a very strong theme in the way that I present. Uh, I like to see something. I want something to look at some stimulus. I can hook meaning onto an object. So getting people to feel is about, yes, it's about my self-expression. Yes, it's about the, the shapes I use, the colours I use and the imagery I use. And I can fashion those as I'm thinking about my presentation to give people a particular target feeling that I want them to have. Here is a, a, a living example. Um, uh, in particular, uh, about about uh, words, I want to give you two examples of things that somebody might say in a presentation, and I want you to um, to tell me which uh, you know, or to, to figure out for yourself which you think is actually the most interesting. Here's how not to make people keen to do something. I think 
So I, uh, you imagine uh, now, for the sake of argument, that I am your director of sales. Um, the the donkeys, uh, the stuffed donkeys in our store in Epping are, are going to start to uh, decompose around about September next year uh, because the warehouse is a bit damp, uh, as you all know. So we're going to have to take uh, some of them into all our territories, whether we like it or not. Um, and the sooner we start, the better. Basically, there are 12,000 uh, of the little buggers. So we really need to sell them next year, because if we don't, um, we're just uh, going to have to chuck them away into landfill. They go. And uh, currently the stuffed toys are tying up about 55 grand. So best effort, everybody. Option two. OK, this is Famous George um, and next year, between you and me, we're going to uh, find 12,000 homes for George and his brothers and sisters. Now, each sale will make us five pounds. Uh, George has a price on his head. Every single one of the 12,000 that we have is worth a fiver. So. Basically, you know that the warehouse is shot and the sooner we can get George and his brothers and sisters out of the warehouse, uh, the better it is for him and the better it is for us. So which would you be most invigorated by? What's going to actually capture your imagination? The number of people who come on stage or into a presenting scenario with a very positive story, but let the negativity creep in just isn't worth talking about. It is such a shame. So one thing I want you to look out for when you're when you're presenting or even preparing to present now is what am I doing that might be invalidating or making my material boring or counter to what I'm trying to do? So I'm going to take you through three different areas to pay attention to. And there are, so there are three areas that I think you should pay attention to, which maximize the chances of you having the emotional effect that you want to have. So the first one is to be really very careful with what you choose, how much material you're expecting people to take in. Now, when I was preparing this particular uh, webinar, I probably had, uh, I was writing it on the train and I reckon I must have had about, I don't know, 25 different points to make. Right up until last night, I was still taking stuff out. I was taking it out because I, I noticed that I was getting confused or there was some material that was jumbled up with other material. So right up until the last minute, I still found myself taking stuff out, which wasn't actually adding. And worse, it was actually making it less good. So first of all, don't be afraid of being really choosy and ripping out a half or a third or two thirds of your material because what you end up with will be really good. So that's about causing confusion. The other point here is also about not overloading people. We often overload. One of the people, one of you said, um, too much material. In fact, at least a couple of you said too much material. And that happens. So even if your material is interesting, even if you're passionate, even if you've got wonderful, wonderful visual aids, it's still possible to overload your people. And I want to come on to specifically what happens uh, in a minute, because there is a particular mechanism, psychological mechanism that, that we're stuck with, which I'm going to uh, mention to you. And the the third thing that I want to bring your attention to in terms of material is interacting with it. There's a story that went around uh, when I was at the University of East London, which involved a, uh, a young uh, chap at medical school. It was the first day of their lecture and the head of clinical medicine, uh, some professor um, who he said, look, 
you know, you know, many of you won't be here in the auditorium uh, in, in four years time. And a lot of what we're going to ask you to do is about obs observation and attention to detail. And then he sticks his finger in a in a beaker of urine. Uh, the, this is the professor and says, and so this is uh, so what I'm going to show you now as a first off um, is is how to test for diabetes um, in, in urine. So he sticks his finger in and he apparently um, then st sticks a finger in his mouth and licks it off. And he says, no, that's absolutely fine. He then gets a, a student from the audience to come out and to do the same. Of course, what this student hasn't noticed is that the professor stuck his first finger into the urine and licked his middle finger, whereas the student sticks his first finger in and licks his first finger. And of course, actually has some urine in his mouth. Uh, the point here is, is that the professor uh, played an absolute blinder because he got the people in the audience to interact. He made uh, a, an incredibly powerful point about so many different things by getting somebody out and by getting them to do an action that they would never, ever forget. So um, that's a very extreme example. It happens to be one of my favorites, but it's it's a way of demonstrating that getting people to do stuff really, really works. And uh, and if if you want to uh, you know come up, try and come up with a topic or material that you think, ah, that doesn't apply to that. And, uh, and we'll take that as a challenge jointly to see if we can actually find a way of making even the driest material interactive. So that's the material. So here are the words. Words, again, th this is a big hobby horse of mine. I am always banging on to people about their words. And again, I'd like to get your view about your least favourite ones. Here are some of mine, uh, some of the, the, the real horrors, I think. So... What are your least favourite uh, words? Um, in, so mine, uh, interface, reach out, touch base, stick a couple in the, in, the, in, the, in the pane now, type a couple in. Any particular words that you think uh, are, are really smack of corporate nonsense? OK, uh, I've got a Andrew, no brainer, Sharon, holistic, uh, you bottom line. Yes. Good one. Uh, Johnny leverage, Tim synergy. Mm, yes. That's an over, uh, Steve Ross. Oh, oh, I don't know if Steve is saying, uh, what well, he was telling me he hadn't, uh, I, I wasn't engaged, but then he, he is, but I, oh, I don't know if engaged is maybe one of the words sensible, uh, Jackie, uh, at the end of the day, pick up the ball and run says, Anne. Wipe its face, Tony. Donna says, get, uh, get go. <laughs> Andrew, no brainer. Yeah, OK. So, yeah, there are some there are some real horrors. Thank you very much indeed for those ones. So corporate waffle dehumanizes us. We don't use words like that at home. And so um, what we what ends up happening is that we we sound like a corporate robot giving a presentation. I think when we're talking to each other, whether we're sitting down together or whether one of us is up front, it's got to be really gripping. And my litmus, and I often do this, my girls, unfortunately, growing up, but I used to show them stuff when they were six, seven, eight years old and find out if they actually understood it. Did they get it? Because if they got it, I knew I'd, I'd, I'd achieved uh, some success in the preparation. Corporate waffle kills interest and passion and it also makes people skeptical which is even worse plain language is believable because it's what we use when we have feelings about something and as you said one of you said a couple of you at least passion you expect the person that is presenting to you to be passionate to believe when we use hollow cliches we're not believable because they're not the words that we use when we're impassioned. OK, and so the third piece I want to draw your attention to is the story. So this is probably, I think, the most important one. And we can make some mistakes in with our material. We can maybe have too much material. We can be a bit flabby with words if we find a way to tell the story. 
I mentioned a few minutes ago when I was under when I was talking about material that we've got to be really choosy. We've got to make sure that we don't have too much of it. And now I want to explain the science behind why that is the case. You may have come across a phenomenon or a psychological principle called the magic number seven plus or minus two. What does this mean? Well, uh, essentially, we have something called a visual spatial scratch pad. And this thing actually um, tells us or determines how much, how many thoughts we can hold in our minds at any one time. Through extensive research, it turns out that most of us can hold between five and nine pieces of information. The average, the median, obviously being seven. So what what is happening there? Why is that the case? Well, the magic number seven plus or minus two is the case because we actually have real difficulty packing things away. We don't know how to put them away. So we see and hear and feel lots of things. And it and unless we really try hard, most of us just try and throw everything or our, our mind will just throw everything in higgledy piggledy. And it then becomes almost impossible to find more than between five and nine things very quickly. So I want to show you how to get over this by telling stories. But firstly, what I want to do is I want to run a little test with you, um, a little memory test. Now, these are the sorts of things that I absolutely am horrible at. I think largely because my mother never really made me tidy my room. She always did it for me. And so mine um, very much ended up looking like this. So what I'm going to flash up on the screen uh, in, in a couple of moments is a picture which contains a number of objects. And without writing anything down, I'm going to give you 30 seconds looking at those objects and then we'll see how many of those objects um, that you can actually recall. Uh, and we'll, and, and then there's a second part of the experiment. OK, so stand by with your memory. And here we go. Your 30 seconds with the objects starts now. Fifteen seconds left. OK, that's your lot. So the, th the theory is that if you actually try and remember a whole load of things like that, most people will remember five or six. If you're particularly good at this kind of thing, you might remember uh, more than that. So right now, uh, straight away, uh, see how many uh, the names of the objects you can you can write down. Go for it. And then tell me in the Q&A pane how many you managed. And I'm going to give you about another 10 seconds to write down as much as you can. And then tell me what. Um, what you managed to remember, how many? OK, stop there. How many of you remembered? OK, Victoria P got nine. Well done. Very good. Tony, eight. Uh, Graeme, seven. Petra and Laura on seven. Tony, uh, W, eight. Katrina, eight. Vicky, nine. Sharon, seven. Anne and Steve, uh, six. Charlotte, nine. And <laughs> Neil just has remembered one thing. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Neil, you remembered seven. Well done. Lovely to see you, by the way. I haven't seen you on these things for ages. At Samantha, nine. Very good. Interesting. I'm just quickly scanning the numbers again. Did anybody get any more than nine? Isn't that interesting? Uh, yes, Hugh, you're one of the high scorers. So uh, and, and Victoria. So isn't that interesting? So if if we were to run that that thing again, here we go. Now I'm going to tell a little story uh, and let's see how it goes. OK, so here's the story which could stitch them together. So uh, the first thing, when I get up in the morning, 
I uh, the first thing that I see uh, is is my uh, is my digital watch. It's a sports watch, and uh, believe me, I don't get up at uh, sixteen fifty eight. Um, and of course, the second thing I then see is a picture of my wife and Vianne uh, when she was a tiny baby, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, often uh, there are random things uh, strewn around the, uh, the bed as I get out. And, and this morning I actually trod on a stapler. Um, I must have been um, doing a bit of work in bed the other evening. But anyway, there, there we have it. Anyway, on Saturday mornings, what well, typically what I do uh, when I get out of bed is is I get ready to go and play a, a, a bit of tennis. And so collect, um, you know, tennis balls, very important, uh, obviously, and, and a good quality one. Often the cheap ones from supermarkets, they're well, they're like beach balls. They're about as much use because they go soft very quickly. Um, and then um, whenever I go and play tennis, I always make sure that I take a couple of uh, business cards with me in my in my uh, racket case, um, because you never know who you're going to meet. Uh, unfortunately, what tends to happen is the inside of the racket case can get rather damp. So I, I shove a bit of toilet paper in there um, and that seems to keep the racket and my business cards dry. Unfortunately, my racket cover, because I've had it for so long and I'm in the habit of brushing it against things, you know, when the racket, you know, taking practice swings, I've created a couple of holes in the end. So I've, I've taped them up um, and uh, to, to try and uh, keep the damp out. And of course, uh, in fact, it was a couple of Sundays ago um, when I went to play. Um, we had to be very careful uh, to not um, play beyond uh, 11 o'clock or um, because obviously it was Remembrance Sunday and I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, that we observed that correctly. And obviously after tennis, every time uh, it's always uh, has to be a, a, a cup of coffee uh, and uh, and a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a relax. And uh, and of course, um, you know, boys being boys, I, I, I tend to play with boys. Uh, it's somebody who always has a, some sort of gadget to show off. And uh, and my Swiss Army knife is is certainly one of my favorite gadgets. Now, you can imagine um, that uh, it's probably if I if I said nothing for 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 10 or 15 minutes or maybe if I ask you right at the end, how many objects can you remember now, even if it's 10 minutes away, uh, you may find that you uh, remember a lot more. So no matter how stupid the story, we can still actually make a big difference. Um, in fact, Tony reckoned he, he remembered, I don't know if he just remembered 12 as a result of uh, the story uh, or whether he actually remembered 12 originally. So um, the the point here is stitching things together overcomes the problem that we have with our visual spatial scrap scratch pad we can get over that whole um, magic number seven plus or minus two when we we concatenate that's a bit of uh, psycho babble concatenate chain together the different th uh, bits and themes and that seems to work really really well okay so no uh uh, piece on presentations would be would be complete without an allusion to the dreaded. So here's a little piece for all you PowerPoint lovers. If you must, uh, I have a little uh, presentation that I put together for you to just point out the main things to uh, go towards or avoid. First of all, if you must use PowerPoint, don't use some tacky background. I've got to say that there are some absolutely wonderful themes on there now. There really are. The problem is, is that they're a bit too good and that they will compete with you and especially with your material. So don't be tempted to to use the really good stuff. Clip art. Um, I'm glad to say I think they've even taken it out of word now, but it's still around and I still see people use it try not to. Instead, photographs. I love good quality photographs. And every now and again, I search out one. And this uh, this old boy I used for something, uh, I, you know, I can't, I can't even remember what it was. But I used this photograph because I thought his feelings were ambiguous. I couldn't tell whether he was bored or pensive or sad. And I just think it's a fantastic, evocative photograph. And I never tire of, of, of looking at it. I, I can invent stories about this guy and where he's been and what he's done, where he lives, what nationality he is, how old he is and so on and so forth. So a good photograph, a great image um, is actually worth using. If you can't have the object, at least get a decent image. Bullet points. 
try and cut out or eliminate bullet points. This is a bit from the beginning of my screen. Instead, the three of those bullet points, incidentally, were about um, how Nicola could help you. So an image you have there and just a little instruction. And of course, um, you know, use the fewest number of words. I set myself a little target. I never use more than nine words. So there we have it. Uh, I've, I think I've used a lot less than that. Four, five, six, seven words and some symbols. Obviously, this one is uh, recording. And this one is if you have questions or a problem, uh, bring it up. Just stick your hands up and you can ask questions at the end. Transitions. This is the this is the cracker lots of special effects and in fact as i said before the special effects in powerpoint now are better than ever but oh my goodness are they distracting so here's a couple of brilliant transitions look at that i mean uh, that's just gifted but again it's totally detracting from the material so you know if you are going to um use things be really careful that's a more conservative one i can live with that one um, because it's not fancy and it's a little bit, it's a little bit, it's, it adds a bit of polish without actually detracting from the material. That one is fabulous, but it's way over the top. So anyway, that's what I have for you on, on PowerPoint. Um, if you must, as I said, uh, if you must. Okay, any uh, thoughts, questions, reactions that you, that you have about what I've said? Here we go. Uh, Victoria, if you work in a corporate uh, where people want lots of detail on PowerPoint, what is your advice? Well, well, I think and Neil's been on one of my sessions and my advice, as he probably remembers, is uh, put it in a handout. Uh, you can you can allude to the fact that there's more detail. And what I think is a really interesting way of including a lot of detail without including a lot of detail is to give people a little piece of all of the sections of detail that you've got. Give them examples and then make them hungry to want to go and find out more. This tends to be an approach which some of the best lecturers in university, if you, uh, and if you think back to your university days, the best ones actually whetted your appetite so much that you wanted to devour the reading list. Lectures were not for learning, they were for stimulus and for posing questions. And I think good presentations probably pose a lot of questions and make people eager to find out more. Hopefully that uh, is good enough. Andrew, what uh, what presentation are you using, Paul? Um, th this, this one here is actually called um, Sketchbook Pro. A Sketchbook Pro, it's incredibly cheap. It takes quite a lot of practice, but a, a very nice chap called Kevin Holligan who used to be at Mars and I worked with there and then he and I have seen quite a bit of each other when he's been in different places. But he really taught me a lot about how to use Sketchbook Pro and taught me the tricks. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, that's that's what I use. And I, I swear by it, Andrew. Um, I think it's an interesting thing. You can import graphics into it. And uh, yeah, I, th I think it I think it really ha helps. Uh, any advice to a friend who is a little uh, introverted. Yes, Tony. And I was hoping somebody would ask this. I haven't covered this, the whole emotional piece about the presenter and how some people feel uh, who are stepping out. I think the, the best way um, for somebody who is introverted and I think uh, people who tend to be quiet, if that's what we're talking about, introverted or feel embarrassed in front of groups or awkward or very self-conscious, uh, number one rule is to totally be themselves, to try not to be anybody else, because I think people who come on quietly and without lots of pizzazz actually make very engaging uh, presenters. And the second thing I would advise is to actually admit the awkwardness. And I do that almost by default now. Uh, I was giving a... Um, uh, I had a gig, a speaking gig uh, last week in the city uh, to 60 um, uh, female uh, chartered company secretaries, a formidable crowd. They were so nice, uh, but I couldn't help. Th and I was I was uh, I was talking about self-confidence. And uh, I mean, it's a double whammy, isn't it? Um, you get up and you're not feeling, you know, 100 percent confident and you're talking about self-confidence. So I just came straight out with it. Uh, and actually, that does boost your confidence immensely. It's it's it lets the cat out of the bag. It it's a it's a brave thing to do. So that's what I would say, uh, Tony. Um, 
uh, Jonathan says, you haven't said anything about the presenter's energy. Yeah, uh, I haven't. Uh, I suppose the two things. One, know your stuff, as somebody said earlier on. And secondly, um, you have to want to be there. Um, you have to really believe what you're saying. Now, some somebody's bound to now say, come up with a question. What happens if I don't believe what I'm talking about? Mm. That is probably the hardest of all. I would probably say just keep it very brief and stick to the facts and pick out some things that you really do believe in about the message and emphasize that. Tim, um, what would you say was the ideal length for a presentation? This one here is now into its 40th minute. I think that's probably too long. I've let myself off the hook and I've broken lots of rules of my own rules that you've probably noticed because it's a webinar. But if you were in the room with me, we'd be doing stuff together. So if I was going to go this long, we would be doing a lot of things together. People coming out the front, the lectures that I give or whatever presentations tend to be very interactive. I always bring something up to the front. I always get them actually doing a piece of behavior. I reckon 30 minutes is pretty much on, on the spot, even if you're interesting. OK, it's 10 past 11. There are quite a few questions yet to do. So I, as promised, I'm going to now do a little summary just in case you need to get away. Uh, bang on uh, at 10 15. And then those who don't have uh, such a heavy schedule, then you can stay on afterwards. Uh, so here's the grand summary. Firstly, um, uh, be yourself. Um, don't be a robot. Use your own language. Use your words um, as for, for the, 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 the rather introverted uh, person that Tony's talking about. Be themselves. The second thing is, is be brief. Uh, people um, love it when we respect uh, their time. And and as to pick up on what Tim said, if you have, um, you know, maybe an uh, one hour, uh, be really conservative and just uh, use that first bit and give people 15 minutes to show you that they're either interested or that they're dying for a break. And lastly, I would say um, be be real, um, use uh, use objects, use use uh, real things. Well, you know, you know, draw things at the time, um, you know, silly cartoons, even if you can't draw very well and and pictures. It brings it alive. People feel that they're there at the beginning of the presentation, like they're, they're in your thoughts. So if you're prepared to be uh, scruffy and maybe a bit halting, as I have been um, trying to collect my thoughts, trying to press the right button and move my arms and legs in the right place, it's a much more genuine uh, and engaging way to to be spoken to. And hopefully people will remember. Well, I believe they will remember. Um, so that's all I have for you um, uh, this time. Um, I just want to put in a quick, uh, a quick advertisement for the for the new year. Uh, in the new year, we've got uh, Friday the the twenty second of January is our first uh, webinar of the year. So put that in your put that in your diary. Uh, I don't know what the topic is yet, um, but if you'd like to suggest one, that would be absolutely fantastic. It's always great to get uh, suggestions. In fact, the most uh, successful. A topic um, that we've run this year was suggested um, by one of you. Actually, I've got to say, I felt really nervous about the topic when it came up. Uh, it was um, how to manage upwards. I was nervous because it was so cliched. Uh, it was potentially really manipulative. Uh, it made assumptions that the bosses and their reports probably had a lousy relationship and all sorts of things. Um, but I stuck to it uh, and uh, and I really uh, tried to uh, get some good material together. I wrote the blog uh, and, and put that out. And we had more people um, booking in for that webinar uh, than anything else. Um, so. Um, so, yes, keep the topics coming. So it's now uh, 1014. If you can stay on, uh, I'm going to go back to some of the questions that I didn't uh, manage to answer before. So let me just uh, scroll back uh, to that screen. OK, um, Tim, how do you avoid interaction and questions knocking you off course? Interesting question. I, li I like uh, uh, questions and, uh, and interactions 
uh, as you've realised, Tim. Uh, I would prefer getting knocked off course, I suppose, uh, than, than being boring or not memorable. Um, in front of me, I have my, my trusty IWC. I, I think it's a knack that you develop of keeping an eye on the time. Rehearsal helps. I don't over-rehearse. I go through the material a couple of times, otherwise I go nuts. But I think having that, um, that's probably another awful phrase, internal compass. I have this internal stopwatch and I also know the map of the material. So I know, I even write on here, you will see here, I don't know if you can see that, I've written on what time I need to be at a certain point by. So I have mile posts, timing mile posts to keep me on track. But I think better to be diverted than to be to be boring, Tim. Thanks for the question. Uh, using position on stage to signal content. Frank, that's a really cracking one. I coached somebody a couple of weeks ago. It was the same person who was giving the mega presentation to the 75 um, top leaders, global global leaders. And he um, and he was going to give a very competent and, uh, you know, fine presentation. And then but what he told me that he was following the marketing department on who had had their, their agency um, put um, um, a fantastic all whistles and bells, flashing lights presentation together, music and all that kind of stuff. And I said, look, we've got to do something about that because you're three o'clock in the afternoon. You're one of the last people on and you're talking about strategy. Bang. And so we got him all sorts of little tricks like we had. He was in darkness for the first three minutes of his of his presentation so that people were just hearing a voice and seeing some single very large images projected on a wall about the place that they wanted the organization to be and then there were three pools of light across the stage each with a scruffy cardboard box at the center of the very sharp circle of light and in each box he had a an object or a series of objects that helped him to tell the story uh, they, they were basically business case studies and in the boxes he had different objects objects that represented the brands that he was talking about and it was basically saying we're not going to do it like this bunch of people but we are going to do it like this bunch of people and that's and that's what he did and so he walked across the stage and it also helped him to remember where he was in his presentation lots of eye relief lots of amusement lots of very ordinary mundane objects giving a very powerful impression that you know strategy is solid it's plain. It's, I mean, it just sent all the the, the messages that he wanted to uh, in a very low tech way. So the perfect antithesis. So the uh, movement on stage. That's a fantastic um, a prompt, Frank. Thank you for that one. Are, are pictures wrong? Asks Andrea. Um, no, pictures aren't wrong. It's just that be really careful what you choose. Um, I try not to use people uh, at all. Uh, ob pictures of objects, fine fields, fluffy lambs. I try to keep people away because they're a distraction, uh, keep people out of it because everybody says, oh, people don't really look like that. They're all models. So no model photography at all. Um, I try and take pictures myself like the hand on the bullets. That was my hand against the my office wall. Um, so I try and do as much homemade as possible. And again, that's it's an extension of my own personality. Um, uh, pictures again. Uh, any different advice from Victoria? Any different advice for presentations given over the phone, which seems to be becoming the norm? Wow. Yes. Uh, yes, there is a piece of advice here. Send everybody a sheet with um, uh, like the cheat sheet that we have. Uh, it's in the handouts pane. If you haven't got it yet, download that. And it's a blank. And I, what I do is I imagine so, that people, some people will fill it in. They'll scribble down things that I've said or they'll a picture. And then we send the completed cheat sheet out tomorrow. Well, no, not tomorrow. <laughs> Nicholas says not on your Nelly. Uh, we'll send the complete cheat sheet out on Monday. And that has all the words and pictures. So that's what I would do, Victoria. Get people um, to give people something to do when they haven't got your sunny face in front of them. Uh, Andrew, handouts could be a way of keeping them uh, to the end. Yes, it uh, could be a way of keeping them. To, I'm not sure if, Andrew, you're saying keep the handout to the end or it could be a way of keeping them to the end. Um, if you're going to give a handout that is 
completed, I would give that at the end. I think I'm probably torturing your meaning, um, but hand up. People have a, a, an awful and soul destroying habit of rifling through handouts when they come to a piece of your presentation that hasn't quite grabbed them. Uh, so handouts, I hand out at the end, unless they're partially filled in and I want people to fiddle with them, in which case I'll give them a partially completed handout at the beginning. Uh, uh, Roberto, uh, that's a fantastic name, Mr. Roberto. With so little on paper, how much notes do you use? Slide text, if anything, gives you a prompt to your storyline. Yes, I do use notes. Uh, so, I, you know, I have a very complete script here, uh, which tells me what I'm supposed to be saying and what's supposed to be on screen. Um, so I go very complete. When I'm standing up and walking around, I have to really uh, anchor myself to my notes. I stick them up on with blue tack. Uh, so I do use a lot of notes, but then when I'm feeling good, I will then find I forget to look at my notes and I'll go off. So the notes maybe just as a springboard for me. Um, uh, positions on, I think Frank, it was, he said, you know, what about positions on stage? I think positions on stage are great. Actors do that to help them to remember the script. You, you do what's called blocking on stage where you walk to different bits. You pick up certain objects. So objects are fantastic anchors. The problem with using a presentation as your script or even alluding to it is that you will find that your gaze goes behind you a lot of the time and you end up talking uh, to the screen or worse still pointing to it or even worse than that, reading it off. So be really, really careful, uh, Roberto, with the screen. Uh, what else? Uh, Vicky says, a great reminder on not using corporate speak, but sometimes some corporate speakers feel that your presentation isn't professional if it doesn't have all the awful buzzwords in it. Send them to me afterwards, Vicky. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know about professional. Uh, gosh. Uh, yes, I wonder, do people think we're less professional if we don't use the buzzwords? People might think we're not on the in-group, but then I suppose we need to decide whether we want to really be on the in-group or do we want to be standing outside it like uh, the, the errant sheep who has decided not to follow the track. Getting all metaphorical and spiritual there, Vicky, but yeah, good point. Some of us are stuck with corporate words. Uh, uh, Andrea, how can we transfer the message with operatives who didn't have the right level of high level of education? So... Um, I think you're saying, Andrea, that some people who you are speaking to don't have a high level of education uh, rather than the people you're speaking to are going to have to pass it on to others. In either case, I think everything I've said this morning applies. Keep it really simple, like a six-year-old can understand it. I'm not saying that even uneducated people um, are often brilliant, but we don't give them the opportunity to just because they're not formally trained to, to adapt their minds to the sort of nonsense that gets spoken in many, uh, not just presentations, but also training sessions. Some training sessions are absolute torture. Um, and and, and, and uh, even the, apparently the soft skills things, people have systems for listening and for asking questions and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and I think they're, they're, they're just disastrous because they're, they're, they're far too complicated and half of it's not even true. So what I would say, Andrea, uh, um, uh, in fact, was, uh, yes, it looks like you are uh, you're Italian. So Andrea, uh, so it might not be Andrea, it might be Andrea, it might be a, a boy, don't know. You have to correct me on that one, is, is, to, is to keep it simple and impactful. And it doesn't matter what the apparent educational level of your audience is, they will get it and they will thank you for being an engaging presenter. OK, I think we've got through all the questions there. Um, thank you for, oh gosh, over half of you, um, almost half of you stuck around right to the end. Um, so thank you so much. I, I hope you have a, a terrific afternoon, wonderful weekend and a, a great festive season. Again, thanks for joining and I will see you uh, in January on the other side. Um, thank you to all of those who asked questions and, uh, and um, told me when I was and wasn't being engaging. All right, take care. All the best. Bye for now.